Good evening. My name is Sharon Wong, and I'm the national president of OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates. The video you just reviewed was part of the tribute to our beloved Judge Michael Kwan, who was our OCA president in 2015. The full video will be shown tomorrow night as part of our closing of the summit. Judge Kwan was such an integral part of OCA. He was a man of his word, a man of integrity, a man of passion, a man full of dedication and service to OCA, a man who always raised his hand when we needed him as a counselor, a mediator, a mentor, a coach, and an advisor. I'd like to ask for a moment of silence in honor of Judge Kwan, whose farewell service is scheduled for tomorrow. Thank you. Now it's my privilege to welcome everyone to the third night of our virtual summit and the first day of workshops and plenary sessions. With the new normal we're in these days, we've adapted to ensure we still bring the programming that you expect and need to be successful as an OCA Asian Pacific American advocate. We had a strong start with our Stop Repeating History panel on Wednesday, where the leaders of the Asian American Pacific Islander History and Advocacy spoke to the dangers to democracy and the importance of allyship. Yesterday, we had another great program with a dialogue following the film First Vote about the various ways AAPIs have been civically engaged despite whichever side you take. 
This summit is special because it is our first ever virtual convention. And we hope to bring people together from across time zones in a weekend of learning, healing, and let's also not forget fun entertainment. The workshops this weekend vary widely. So we have something for all types of audiences and interests, but they are tied together by one theme, resilient communities. Our history shows our resilience, but we know that there is always work that can be done for us to be stronger together as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and as members and allies to the larger community of color. I hope you're able to gather strength, knowledge, and support from this summit to be more resilient and to fight for your own community as well. Thank you for tuning in to our opening plenary, State of Asia, Mar Asia Pacific America, Elections, Census, and Redistricting. We are 92 days away from election day and quickly approaching the census deadline. It is important to give power to the AAPI voice and get out the vote and get counted. And now it is my distinct honor to welcome Greg Orton from the National Council on Asian Pacific Americans, which we all know as NCAPA, to moderate this panel. But before Greg takes over, we have a message from John Saw, Executive Vice President of Advanced and Emerging Technologies at T-Mobile. Please enjoy the rest of the summit. Good evening. My name is John Saw, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Advanced and Emerging Technologies at T-Mobile. I am so grateful to be a part of this event. I continue to be inspired by OCA's efforts to improve the well-being of our communities by breaking down barriers and bringing people together. And on a personal note, I want to thank OCA for being a tireless advocate on behalf of Asian Pacific Americans here in the United States. So thank you for having me for all you do. You might have heard that T-Mobile just recently completed our merger with Sprint. That has been a long time coming, and we are thrilled about what this means for consumers across the country for so many reasons. Now, as I thought about joining you all, it struck me that much of what this merger will help deliver so closely aligns with many of the values that the OCA champions, education, equity and inclusion, and workforce development, all critical components of the fabric of our communities and are highly reliant on digital access. And that's where the new T-Mobile comes in. We are working to bridge the massive digital divide that exists in our country today by building a supercharged, transformative nationwide network that will deliver 5G for all. And we really mean for all. Our combined network will offer connectivity across the United States, where before it did not previously exist or wasn't possible. Now, with T-Mobile and Sprint's combined resources, it is not only possible, I'm excited to share that it is in good progress. We knew this was important, but now, in the midst of this pandemic, we have seen that it is so essential. And a glaring example I want to talk to you about is the digital learning gap. It's always existed, but now it has become more acute as learning has moved to homes and families are reliant on reliable connectivity. Fortunately, T-Mobile and Sprint each had programs dedicated to addressing this need before the crisis. So we were ready to respond separately. And now together, we are deploying digital learning solutions to hundreds of thousands of students across thousands of schools and school districts nationwide. And now, as a bigger company, 
with combined resources, we can do even better. I am so proud to announce that we will soon roll out Project 10 Million, a program that will connect 10 million families over five years by offering free service, hotspots, and low-cost devices. I also want to touch on our commitments to diversity and inclusion, another current and critical topic in communities right now. Like so many, T-Mobile has worked to be better in advancing the narrative around racial injustice and sharpening our focus on actions we can take to be better in this space. This is not new for us. In fact, this topic played an integral part in our merger as well. Last year, we made a $25 million commitment to diversity and inclusion initiatives with leading civil rights groups, including you at OCA, through a historic memorandum of understanding. This MOU outlines our commitment to improving diversity in corporate governance, workforce recruitment and retention, and community investment, and more. And now I'm pleased to share that with the completion of the merger, we have started making huge strides forward in that work. Soon, we will be announcing the members of our newly formed National Diversity and Inclusion Council, which will include representatives from all the organizations that signed the MOU, including the OCA, as well as other prominent community leaders. We truly look forward to continuing our partnership with you. Again, thank you for let, letting me share a few words with you. The relationship we hold with our customers, our employees, the communities we serve, and partners like OCA are so crucial. T-Mobile is the uncarrier, a company that has shaken up an industry because we have always looked for opportunities to create change by listening. This will never change. Working alongside you all and so many others, we can make meaningful impact to address issues and create solutions that make lasting impacts. Thank you for having me today. We look forward to continuing our partnership and the good work ahead. And have a great Sunday. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Orton. I'm the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. And for those who don't know who NCAP is, we'll, uh, we'll give you a pass this time. But uh, we are the coalition of 37 of the largest, uh, most prominent Asian American Pacific Islander civil rights and nonprofit organizations in the country. Um, a number of our panelists tonight uh, and the organizations they represent are members of NCAP. And for those of you who have you know, OG OCA cred, you already know that OCA was one of the founding members of NCAPA way back in the late 90s. And so we're talking about back when Daphne and Karen were sitting around a table with a handful, a handful of few other API leaders talking about how messed up it was that we as a community had to fight so hard to be recognized by Congress and by decision makers. Uh, we all know that fast forward to today, much has changed, but also many things have remained the same and that fight continues. So thank you to OCA for, for having me here tonight. Uh, congratulations on the, the panel and on the sessions that you're holding. And it is my, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our panelists uh, for tonight's plenary on the census elections and redistricting. Now, I think it's safe to say that 2020 has not gone the way any of us planned. And I know for myself, I definitely plan on getting more than one haircut in 2020. But here we are, and I'm going to stay strong for as long as I can. Uh, but you know, all joking aside, and being able to laugh about how disrupted our lives have been is a certain privilege and blessing, right? Because many of us have lost loved ones. Many of us are facing challenges with how do we send our kids to school? How do we make sure our children are educated during this difficult time? Almost all of us probably have thought about when going out for groceries because we had to, you know, this new mental calculus of preparing for potential harassment on the streets that we all know has happened all over the country and all over the world. And so certainly our lives have been upended. But nonetheless, the challenges of 2020 and the importance of this year 
remain the same, whether it is the census or the election that is coming up in a few months. And so it is my pleasure to have with me a number of distinguished panelists and be able to talk about all these important topics. So rather than spend a lot of time introducing them because all of them have resumes that are far longer than mine and deserve deserving of accolades and all sorts of accomplishments, um, I'll ask that our panelists introduce themselves, where they're coming from or where they're Zooming from uh, and the organizations they represent and some of the work they do. From there, we'll get into a, as lively a discussion as we can have online about the census, the election and redistricting. And then from there, um, all of you who have submitted questions through the apt uh, Drifta, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but we'll make sure that they get to us that, and then we can then pose them to our panelists. Um, so without further ado, if we can start with Christine Chen to introduce herself. Hi everyone, it's so great to see many of you. I did uh, take a look at the Drifta to see who was in attendance. So it's great to see so many um, great extended family members here with us. Um, today I am representing um, as executive director for Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. Um, we are a national nonpartisan organization that works with local partners like many OSA chapters to mobilize Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in electoral and civic participation. Now we actually have a special history with OCA because OCA provided the space to give birth to API vote back in 1996. At that time, I was a staff member working with executive director then um, Daphne Kwok. Michael Lin was a national president and we all um, thought, you know what, even though we're fighting for um, issues such as immigration, census, hate crimes, a lot of the same issues that we all hear um, that we're all addressing these days, um, but we needed more strength and it really would only come through the power of our, of our vote. Um, so that was the idea of in 1996 when a number of us um, launched that. And since then, we've continued to work with a number of OCA chapters around the country. Now this year, we continue to remain diligent and really focus that, to ensure that all eligible voters should have the option to vote, whether it's by mail or in, in person um, safely. You know, we continue to believe that democracy is strongest when every vote is counted and that every American can make their voice heard. Now, many of you had seen API Vote um, as we traveled around the country last year, conducting um, census and voter engagement trainings. Um, hopefully many of you had tuned in when OCA and Kappa, many of the, uh, these groups that are um, tuned in today, where over 250 organizations came together to support the national presidential um, town hall. Um, but with that, now that we've gotten the attention of the candidates and the media, it's our turn to ensure that we work with the local grassroots to make sure that you have the capacity to build up um, your efforts to do voter registration, voter education, and GOTV work. But we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that a little bit more, and I'll go ahead and um, pass it on to my other panelists. Great. Thanks, Christine. Next up, could we have Kathy introduce herself? Hi, Kathy Lacey. I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I'm actually Zooming from Denver, Colorado. And our role is we are the implementation arm of the U.S. Census Bureau for the 2020 census. And we'll, our group is the one that's going to be out there collecting the census data that we'll be delivering at the end of the year. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, next, Jerry. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jerry Vadamal. I'm the director of the Democracy Program at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, ALDEF. Uh, we are a national organization. We're headquartered in New York. I'm Zooming from Strong Island, uh, just outside the city. Um, some of, I think many chapters here work with us on our Asian American exit poll and poll monitoring program and some of the panelists here uh, I know have worked on it and support, uh, and support us on that program. Uh, we do a lot of work around um, census, voter protection, language access and redistricting and looking forward to a, a great panel today, tonight I should say. Thanks Jerry and finally John. All right, thank you, thank you, Greg. My name's John Yang. I'm the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. It's a special pleasure to be here with the OCA Summit. Uh, Christine and I share time in our past with respect to OCA. I served as General Counsel of OCA National in the early 2000s. And I really appreciated actually the tribute to Judge Kwan because Judge Kwan certainly was a dear colleague and friend of both of us 
uh, in those days with OCA and working together to provide order, to provide strategic direction for the organization. Uh, currently, I am the executive director of Advancing Justice AAJC. We are part of an affiliation of five independent affiliates, me being located in DC. We also have affiliates in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Chicago. Uh, my, our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. We do that through a number of different program areas. Substantively, they involve immigration, census, voting, discrimination, and tech and telecom. In terms of how we go about doing that, that includes through litigation, through community engagement, through the media, and through policy advocacy, especially in DC. And certainly a number of the issues that all of us work on are issues that all of us care deeply about. And I also have the pleasure and privilege of serving as a co-chair for NCAPA. And within the census space, where we're gonna be talking about, uh, we serve as the uh, census task force co-chair for, for the leadership conference for civil and human rights and really trying to provide some of the strategic direction and framework for this critical mission that we have for this year. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, and before we now get into, you know, the real discussion around these three important topics, uh, let's take a quick moment to say, I know you're looking at other things on the internet right now, so come back to us. And if you still insist on, you know, looking at ESPN, because I know baseball's back, basketball just came back, hey, maybe open up a new window, pull up my2020census.gov, and if you haven't, you can fill out the census. Um, but anyways, um, we'll start with Kathy, um, especially because we appreciate the fact that you're spending some of your time um, as a representative of the Census Bureau to really help us understand what's going on. And I want to say for everyone who's watching, it's important to re remember it has been a challenging few, you know, few years in terms of getting ready for this census, but we should take a moment to appreciate the hard work of many civil servants like Kathy who have dedicated their careers to making sure the census goes well. And so, Kathy, thank you again for joining us. But my first question to you is, you know, I know when you started this year, you put your game face on for the 2020 census, and then the wheels came off and everything changed. And so where are we today? What can you share with our, you know, our viewers about where the Bureau is in its process, but also how would you respond or what can you say to the, those of us who are concerned about some of those news reports that we've been hearing lately about the potential of moving up the uh, collection end date uh, up a month? So Kathy, please go ahead. So where we are right now is we're in the self-response phase. So I really appreciated the fact that you said, pull up the website. If you haven't responded, complete your census questionnaire. So how long did it take you to complete your questionnaire? Three minutes? Yeah, it took me a couple of minutes. Yeah, it was pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, really, really easy. So uh, we are actually, parts of the country have already started what we call our non-response follow-up operation. Um, COVID-19 did kind of derail and delay some of our operations. So for non-response calls, we normally would have wrapped it up today, to be quite honest with you. Uh, COVID-19, we pulled our staff out of the field uh, during a period of time to make sure things would be safe for them and safe for the public. Uh, we restarted that and we have actually started our non-response follow-up phase. Uh, we will be starting other areas between now and August the 9th. That's a little bit earlier than the date that we had previously announced. From the operational standpoint, I have 50 offices I'm responsible for in 12 states, and we, we've been ready to go. People have been selected, people have been trained, and some of our areas, again, are going to be starting up this Saturday, and some areas are already out there. Uh, so as far as that non-response follow-up phase, uh, what we're looking at is trying to mobilize to get that completed as soon as possible. Uh, why? Because we still have statutory requirements to uh, actually deliver the census data by December the 31st of this year, and we are dedicated to doing that. Uh, previously, uh, we had budgeted two and a half months for the non-response follow-up operation. I actually oversaw the census uh, for our 12 state area last census and we completed it in actually less than two months. So uh, we are working towards that right now. Great, thanks Great, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so I guess next we'll turn to John and Jerry, but first starting with you, John, so 
what is the community perspective right now as far as where we stand on the census? How are we doing as a community as far as response rate? And what is your organization doing to really help uh, drive some of that work? Thanks. And, and let me start perhaps with a couple of important updates. And thank you, Kathy, for being on this. And uh, I echo Greg in thanking you as a civil servant for everything that you're doing. Uh, this is not an easy time and we really, really appreciate it. And let me also be clear to the audience. I'm, I am going to say some things about what the Census Bureau is not doing. This is not directed at Kathy and the career staff. Uh, unfortunately, right now we are in some turmoil because of some political decisions have, that have been made. So let me talk about those very directly. And there are two things that everyone should be aware of uh, that happened literally within the last 10 days. First thing is, I, I'm sure everyone has seen in the news that the president issued a presidential memorandum on July 21, seeking to exclude from apportionment count undocumented immigrants. Uh, now notice what I have said, exclude from apportionment counts undocumented immigrants. So let me tell you what that is and what that is not. What that is not is it does not change anything to census 2020 or the operations around census 2020. Everyone should still be responding to the, the census and responding as quickly as possible. The census has not changed. The form has not changed. The questions have not changed. There is no reinsertion of a citizenship question or any sort of question about immigration status. So people should be rest assured that they should respond to the census and that the Census Bureau and under law has the strongest confidentiality provisions every, anywhere. So that that individual data that does not include an immigration status question will not be shared in a way that will disclose your individual identity. And there are a number of organizations, including all of ours that are on this call, that are working hard to defend that. So that's not what this presidential memo is about. What it is about is about what's called reapportionment. Apportionment is what happens after the census in determining how many seats each state get, gets in Congress. And what the president is trying to do is to take these numbers, exclude or subtract from the total population counts of undocumented immigrants, and based on those revised numbers, determine how many seats each state gets. Now, if you start doing the math, the Pew Research put out a, a report on this, and they estimated that that would, would result in a loss of seats in places such as California, Texas, and Florida. We think that it is clear that this is unconstitutional. And this is something that we are already, a number of organizations are already challenging that we are challenging as well. It is unconstitutional because if you look at Article 1, Section 2 of, of the Constitution, it makes clear that you count all persons, not all citizens, not all legal residents. It says all persons. And the Constitution makes clear in different sections of the Constitution the difference between persons and citizens. And there's a long you know, I'm a lawyer by training, so I'm going to bore you a little bit, but there's a long line of Supreme Court cases, laws, even policy judgments going back to President Ho Herbert Hoover that make clear that this is based on all people, right? Uh, yeah, I think of, I have two young children, so I think of the Dr. Seuss book, uh, Horton Hears a Who, which says a person is a person no matter how small. And we are not saying that immigrants are small in any way, but they are certainly persons. So that is what that, that issue is about, the presidential memo. And like I said, there are challenges already in court. There are probably gonna be more challenges and we don't see how that, that will stand scrutiny. But that is one thing that is happening. The second change that is important, and Kathy alluded to this, is that previously, and many of you that have been participating before, you have heard us say, literally I was saying this on Monday on one of these calls, that the response, final response date when the non-response follow-up will be finished was October 31. That has changed. Now the new guidance is that the, the non-response follow-up, including data collection, ends September 30th. Now there's a little bit of lack of clarity, at least from what we've been told, in terms of whether any submissions will be taken after September 30th, but the way in which it's worded suggests that that any responses received after September 30 probably would not be counted. And like Kathy said, some of the non-response follow-up work that we all thought would be taking place starting in mid-August has been shifted up to try to meet these new deadlines. So that is another reason why it is urgent for all of us to respond now, whether it is online, whether it's on paper, if you still have the form, or whether it is by telephone, is that the time cannot be sooner at this point. 
uh, because all of these deadlines are shifting. Uh, the last thing I would say, and I apologize for taking up a little bit of time up front because I do think these things are important, is I would ask for two calls for action for our community. Uh, the first is with respect to this end date for the census. And we are asking people to call their members of Congress, uh, call their senators to ask to ensure that we push back that date back to the original October 31. You know, previously, be based on COVID-19 and everything that is happening in this country, we have serious doubts about whether a proper non-response follow-up can happen within the compressed time frame that we're talking about. Uh, and again, this is no offense to Kathy and her crew, but it is just a reality of what this country looks like in terms of how we can open up. And we think that that extended date is important. And so we do want people to push back and try to get as much time in the field for everyone to do this professionally and to do this right. And the second thing that we are probably going to be ask, call, asking people to call their members of Congress on will be with respect to that reporting date for when apportionment data goes, uh, goes to the president. As Kathy said, currently it is at the end of December, December 31 is when the Census Bureau is supposed to deliver this data to the president. And then the president is supposed to transmit that data to Congress. The Census Bureau itself admitted, again, as, you know, as soon back as two weeks ago, uh, that they really need that extra time because of COVID-19 to not only gather the data with respect to the non-response follow-up, but really ensure the quality of the data. Because even after that cutoff date, you need to do quality checks. You need to double check because there is going to be what's called duplications that they're trying to do as they go, but there, there's going to be follow-up work that's necessary. We are very, very concerned that in this compressed time frame, that cannot happen in a proper way. And the, the Census Bureau itself, the administration itself, asked for that more time. Now they're trying to retract it. So I would ask people to be on the lookout for calls to action around that. Last thing I would say is why are they doing this? They're obviously doing this, and when I say it's the political structure, because they're trying to make certain communities invisible. They're trying to make communities like ours that are harder to count uh, in, invisible and reduce our political power. And that is something that obviously cannot stand. This is up to us to make sure that our, our voice is out there. It is up to us to make sure that we are counted, that we push these levers so that we get that accurate count. Uh, again, when we talk about this accurate count, right now there's still about 37% of the population that has yet to be counted. So in order to do that, we need that time, we need that infrastructure, and we need everyone to pull together. Thank you. Thanks, John. And uh, leave it to the former general counsel of OCA to start signing the constitution. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's right. He's right. Uh, the stakes really do matter. And so, Jerry, uh, what about all this? Like, what is your organization doing? But also, how do we shake people out of this sort of almost apathy of being sheltered in place? Because we've all had to adjust our lives. But like, help us understand and help our viewers understand what's really at stake um, with this census. Yeah. So, you know, with ALDEF, we work with uh, a lot of OCA chapters and other organizations. Um, you know, we're not built like some of these um, community-based organizations and grassroots organizations where there was this really great apparatus that was built up over a couple of years to have people knocking on doors and um, having these uh, interactions with community members. And just at a really critical moment, um, we had to sort of pivot as a community, uh, just like everyone had to with COVID and uh, try and reach people uh, through the computer or, or with the phone. Uh, one thing that we did do, and we were able to have at least a, a bunch of these presentations, we went around the country and to a lot of the community-based organizations and communities that we work with to explain, okay, why is census important? How does it fit into all the work that we're all doing? I, I know a lot of groups here, we do naturalization uh, clinics, uh, assist with naturalizations, voter registration, get out the vote, voter protection. Um, of all the things that we do, you know, census and redistricting, those, those are two things that last for 10 years. We're going to last for an entire decade. Uh, and if we don't get it right, we have to live with those numbers and live with certain districts for 10 years. Um, and, you know, just saying that it's your civic duty, right, <laughs> that doesn't resonate at all, right? Uh, we have to connect it to and how is this going to impact our community? How is it going to impact people's lives? We're talking about, okay, money for school, for hospitals, for transportation, for your roads. 
um, after school programs, uh, all the things, you know, I know education is a big thing in our community. Um, and that's one of the few issues that really can get our community fired up. Um, this directly impacts, you know, your children's education, uh, their uh, experience growing up in your neighborhood, the community. So many people in our community, I know we look very closely at school district and uh, community, where do we want to buy a house and, and raise a family. Uh, this directly impacts uh, the experience for our community, uh, how much we're getting funded, um, and, and what our experience is going to be like for 10 years. Uh, we unfortunately have, have been undercounted severely. Uh, it so, sort of happens every, every 10 years, and I know we've mobilized the community to really push back and try and make sure that we're counted. Uh, if we get it right, you know, really great things can happen. Uh, we're going to talk about redistricting a little bit later. Um, but a lot of the problems that we see are really connected uh, to census and redistricting. If we get those two things right, a lot of the other problems we have in our community uh, can be resolved by having effective representation, be having a seat at the table. Uh, you've all heard the, the, the saying, if you, if you don't have a seat at the table, uh, you're on the menu, right? Uh, and we've been on the menu for too long. Uh, so, you know, what, this connects directly to our families, to our communities, um, and we've done these presentations uh, uh, at community-based organizations. We're not going to get everybody in the room. We try and have meetings like this where we spark a, a fire in a few people that can go out and then tell their family and tell their friends. All of us need to commit uh, that we're obviously going to fill out the census, but have all of our family and friends do it as well. Thanks, Jerry. And, and now back to you, Kathy. So obviously, many of us understand the stakes in terms of what's involved with the census and, you know, all of OCA for all the work that they've done certainly do as well. But for those who may watch this after, you know, this live, live viewing, uh, what can you tell us that the uh, Census Bureau is doing to make sure that you also reach the Asian American or Pacific Islander community? Kathy, you're, uh, you're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yep, we got gotcha. you. Okay, we, we have a robust partnership program. So we actually started earlier with our partnership program trying to make sure that we were connecting at the highest level and then going down to the grassroots level. The hard to count community has been a huge target for us throughout this entire time. Uh, connecting with the people who are on this panel today, that's critically important. But working with those service providers to the segment of the population that traditionally would be afraid to respond to the census, doing that education and talking about those things that the money, the billions of federal dollars that are distributed based on census counts and talking and trying to relate that the schools that you send your children to, uh, knowing that that school is gonna be there. You can't plan unless you know and have a good black and white photo of what this country looks like. Uh, it's just 10 questions. So it's not asking for a lot of information. Basically, it's the framework. And then we continue with some of the other surveys that we do that, that provide the color and the depth of that photo. But we need everyone's help to make sure that we get everyone counted. Our mission has continued to count everyone once, only once and in the right place. And that's what we're trying to do with our local partners through our partnership program. We've done things a little differently than we've done things in the past. We've had to learn how to do things virtually. Uh, we've had to learn how to social distance. We've done parades where people stayed in their car and created a great deal of noise in those hard to count communities. And we'll continue some of those things as well as we have mobile questionnaire assistance. Putting the census on the internet opens up a lot of opportunities for us. And working with those grassroots uh, organizations and trying to connect with that segment on a one-to-one -one basis. We're moving more into that as it is safe for our employees and safe for the public to uh, sneak out their doors to their local service provider or whoever it is that helps them out at times. Thanks, Kathy. So, you know, I Given the time we have, I, I, we could obviously spend the whole night talking about the census, um, but we do need to move on now to the election. So I want to give Christine some time to talk because don't let the sunny disposition fool you. She is a grizzled veteran of many, many election cycles, probably more than she wants to admit. But nonetheless, 
I have found myself always inspired and appreciative of her experience and her perspective on the uh, election work that we have to do as a community. And so, Christine, with the election coming up and understanding that it will be one unlike any others in many ways, um, what has your observation been as far as what's changed with COVID-19, but also to our viewers, you know, what would you say to OCA chapters or members about what they can do to get involved? Right, so, you know, heading into 2020, um, I was actually very excited because I felt like the community has gone bigger. There was actually a lot more infrastructure, a lot of organizations and OCA chapters were really interested in getting involved, not only with census, but also preparing for the presidential primaries as well as the general election. Um, also in the headlines, you were hearing that Asian Americans are the fastest growing segment of eligible voters out of um, major racial and ethnic groups in the US. You know, over more than 11 million are um, eligible to register and to go vote. But the question is whether or not we are able to motivate and make sure that all those 11 million are actually registering and, and turning out to actually go vote. Um, and what something that's also unique about us is that a large majority of them are also naturalized citizens. And so that is something that we also need to um, take in consideration as we figure out our strategies in, in terms of um, making sure that they have all the information that they need to be able to um, go and vote. Um, also heading into 2020, I was looking at the numbers for 2018. Like the reality is that, you know, typically the Asian American community has one of the lower voter registration rates in comparison to other communities of color. But in 2018, we saw some really great trends. Um, voter turnout among our community increased by 13 percentage points. That's a 49% increase compared to other midterm elections. Also young voters um, in the Asian American community, once again, that, that was one area where we really needed to move on. Um, they actually tripled in their participation rate. And so with that, you know, we knew that uh, with that we need to go ahead and make sure everyone was trained and ready to just go ahead and activate in 2020. Now, obviously with everything that has transpired, I think a lot of the work that we've all done in 2019 has helped us. Um, even though you know we're, we're, we've been facing a lot of pivoting and changing um, that we've had to do, but because of the prep work that we did, I think we're still at a um, better uh, vantage point in terms of doing this work. Um, but now, the what needs to be done, I think a lot of our lessons that uh, we're learning from doing outreach with census is what we're going to have to apply in terms of uh, getting, getting individuals registering and to go vote, right? A lot of it is going to be focusing on relational organizing. Now, we've heard that before, and many times in our community, we've always have done that, right? We've always leaned on OCA chapters where you know your members and you're able to activate your members, but then they're able to also activate their families and their friends. But now that we know that we're going to be um, having to take continued precautions during this pandemic and we're probably going to be staying at home still and there are not going to be um, community events where you're going to do a lot of one on one interaction, we need to dig even deeper. I need you to look into your Rolodex, expand your Rolodex, and really see who have you not talked to lately. And even, even when you are touching base with them, what are you doing to actually bring up the elections? And not only about, not asking them just about, are you registered to vote? We need to make the connections that the issues and what you're facing now in 2020 is related to decisions that are being made of those who are elected. I believe in 2020, we have, we don't, we actually, um, more individuals understand the connection of issues and how it's actually connected um, to your lives and also how elected officials and their decisions are connected. Um, we're seeing that in terms of everyday decisions that have been made in the last six months, right? So, but we need to continue to remind individuals of that. And then also for those who are already activated, who've been um, going to different protests and, um, and organizing, we also need to make the connection that um, registering and voting is also another tool to, um, for that. And that we are only as collectively, if we all do that, um, can we actually be heard. Now, are we going to be heard? I will tell you that looking at the trends, once again, at um, 
the voter registration rates during the past presidential years and our turnout rates, our turnout rate in 2016 was 49%. That's essentially less than half of our community that are eligible turned out, right? Um, so you can essentially imagine that half your family and friends are not registered and not voting, right? So we have a lot of work to do, but I know you have time because you're at home and you're reconnecting with folks. Um, but the other thing I would also like to know is that as chapters, um, I really encourage you to help us participate in this national celebration for National Voter Registration Day. Um, OSE is going to be providing in the chat room um, a link where you can immediately click on that while, while we're here together and register your own organization to be a partner for National Voter Registration Day and then also early vote, which is October 28th. So first we need to get everyone registered. Then after that, it's all about making sure that they understand um, all the different options for them to go and turn out to go vote. Thanks, Christine. And uh, for those young folks who are watching, I think I'm right there at the bridge, always about building bridges. I think Rolodex is translated to Facebook friends list or Instagram <laughs> friends. Um, so yeah, hit up your friends, make sure that they understand they gotta get registered to vote and then they gotta vote. Uh, but now turning our attention back to Jerry and John, um, you know, both of your organizations do voter protection work. And so what are you both thinking about um, as far as how that work changes in the context of COVID-19? And also what can you tell our viewers what they should be thinking about as we approach the, approach the election? So we'll start with you, John. Sure, thank you. A, a few things. Uh, number one is what we're thinking about is how do we make sure that our communities are informed about what their rights are? You know, and when I say what their rights are for, for the Asian American community, number one is language access, right? So there's a couple of provisions in, in federal voting rights law that helps Asian Americans when it comes to language access. There's something called Section 208, which means that you are allowed to have an assister of your choice at the ballot box. So if you are uncomfortable with English, you are allowed to bring someone in there with you to help you. That is your right. And that person does not have to be a citizen, does not have to be a registered voter in that district. So making sure you understand that. Second piece would what's called Section 203. Certain jurisdictions, because of the number of people that speak that language or the percentage of people in that jurisdiction, they are allowed to have translated ballots. And so making sure, so it, it's probably a little bit too running right up against deadlines for making those types of changes. But if you think you are in some of these jurisdictions, call Jerry, call me, call Christine and find out what your rights are. One of the things that Jerry's organization, my organization, Christine's organizations are all doing is training our community, right? And really it's all of you, especially the OCA chapters, so the local organizations to be on the lookout for these things. If a polling place closes, you should contact one of us and understand what your rights are in terms of filing a lawsuit. You know, I, 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 Jerry's organization, my organization, we're, we're, we would look at that, right? Uh, we would want to make sure that those rights are protected. As we're talking about going into write-in ballots, I think there's a lot of concern around what does that mean in terms of language access for those people that getting that sort of thing in the mail, they would just throw it away. Uh, that's always been a problem in the Asian American community is that outreach to our community in language out, outreach. So again, it's sort of having these discussions. Uh, a couple of resources to offer, if I might. One would be... Uh, Christine's organization and mine run a joint voter protection hotline. It's 888-API-VOTE. So that's another place to call. If you have any of these questions, that, that hotline is operated in multiple, multiple Asian languages. Likewise, I'll go back a little bit. If you have a census question, it's 844-2020-API. Uh, and likewise, if you have a census question, call that, call that hotline. We're happy to help you. Great. And how about you, Jerry? Yeah, so um, COVID is really changing things a lot. Uh, I know many chapters here work with us on election day. We train all the volunteers. Everybody's out there. It's a, it's a really wonderful experience. We're able to protect the community and collect surveys. Um, and we know that's going to be different. Already things were changed because there was early voting, which is a good thing. Early voting, a lot more places, I hope, the community can take advantage of that, uh, especially with COVID. Hopefully there's less of a crowd during early voting. Um, 
but you know we have the issue now with mailing mail-in ballots. Um, we have five states that already did it, um, mostly by mail, uh, and absentee ballots. You know our community. I know there was a few folks that did it, but most of you know a lot of folks would actually come out on election day, especially elderly and or LEP limited English proficient voters. And I got to tell you, you know, John mentioned Section 208. A lot of uh, LEP voters come with their children or grandchildren, and they have that assistance there at the poll site. And if they, you know, I've seen many times that they spoil the ballot because it can be confusing, right? Where uh, you see a candidate listed numerous times because they're running um, uh, as the candidate for numerous parties. Uh, so. LEP voters, and especially, you know, first time voters will oftentimes spoil that ballot. Uh, and we can remedy that usually at the poll site. Um, what about when you're voting by mail, right? You're, you're sending in an absentee ballot. Um, I think we need to really educate our community, know what the, what the rules are. Because uh, if you spoil it on your absentee ballot, uh, it really depends what state you're in on whether you have an opportunity to cure that, uh, uh, that problem, whether you'll even have an opportunity to be notified if, you're, if your vote counted. Um, there's a lot of different things that we have to be aware of. Uh, it sounds nice to say vote by, vote by mail, and it can be a really good thing, but there are you know, certain states and certain jurisdictions, it, it can be pretty e easy to invalidate a ballot. Um, you know, some, some jurisdictions, they just say, oh, the signatures don't match. And it's not like they have a handwriting expert or something. It's just somebody in a board of elections uh, office saying these these don't match. Uh, so there's there are some risks, and I think our community needs to know about that. We sort of pivoting more to that. Um, we didn't you know really have too much devoted to absentee ballots in in, in other years. Uh, we've really pivoted to that to make sure our community can make an informed decision on whether it makes sense for them to vote by mail or you know, an alternative method, whether they, they feel comfortable doing early voting if it's available. Uh, we didn't even talk about, you know, with absentee ballots, whether you're in a state that you still need a valid excuse. A lot of states have moved to no excuse. Some states still have it. And some states say COVID-19 is a valid excuse and some say, no, it's not, right? So we're still trying to sort that out. We need to make sure uh, uh, as advocates for our community that, Every community knows if this is really going to be state by state, you know, very state specific information, what the rules are uh, in their state. Um, and what, one last thing I want to talk about with, with Section 208 and bringing somebody with you, uh, there may be, depending on how things go, and, and it seems like it's getting really, you know, worse, unfortunately, uh, certain restrictions and rules with social distancing at poll sites. Uh, that still doesn't, uh, you know, uh, stop you, doesn't prevent you from exercising your rights under Section 208. You still have that right to bring somebody in with you. Uh, we actually sent uh, letters to all the jurisdictions where we do work to let them know you can still do social distancing, but you still have to respect Section 208. Um, and I did want to take one step back with census. One thing I did want to mention when John talks about Section 203 jurisdictions, they're really great for our community. We have about 27 counties, 27 jurisdictions around the country that translate all of their voting materials, including the ballot. Well, I'm sure some of you may be saying, well, 27, it's surely, you know, it should be more. There were so many, one off the top of my head, Philadelphia, where we were so close to the threshold. And you, you look at census data and ACS data, that's how we get over the threshold, having the community fill out the census and the ACS data. Uh, if our community is not filling that out, so many jurisdictions where we're right about to get Section 203 coverage, we're not going to get that coverage if we if we're not filling out the census. So just another plug for you know why we need to fill out the census and, and vote on election day. Great. I'm going to go a little off script because I think Jerry, you hit on a really important point. Like this is all connected, and so filling out the census brings us right to the threshold or gets us past that threshold for section 203. Remind the non-lawyers, John, what section 203 is again. So how we can actually see how this is all connected. Right, so section 203 is a provision of the Voting Rights Act that says that if you exceed the number of, indiv either exceed the number of individuals in a jurisdiction in a specific locality where they need 
uh, they are limited English proficient and another language is their dominant language, or you exceed a certain percentage in that jurisdiction, then that government must provide ballots in that other language. So, you know, let's say you are in a area that has six and a half percent Vietnamese, right? Uh, or you exceed 10,000 Vietnamese in that, that jurisdiction, then you have to have a ballot in Vietnamese. And you see that number, that 10,000 and that six and a half percent is determined by the census. So if you're at 9,900, that wouldn't qualify. Now we can make some arguments to the local gov government that we're close, we should get it, but then it's discretionary as opposed to required by law. Thanks, John, for, for that clarification. Thanks, Jerry, for, for flagging that. I think that's a really important point, again, to show how this is all connected. Uh, so finally, now let's talk about redistricting. Uh, for those of us who have been in the game for a while, we talk about it all the time, but for many you know, community advocates, many folks who you know, do this work from a volunteer standpoint, redistricting may be something less familiar to them. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what the process is and again, the importance of it. So going back to you, Kathy, you know, what happens after October 31st or now September 30th later this year um, as far as this, the Bureau's work? What happens for you or for your team uh, once that deadline comes and goes? Well, as soon as we finish the non-response follow-up or our data collection operations, then as far as the once the data is collected, then it actually starts that review process, making sure that we've unduplicated, making sure that um, basically, for the most part, it, at that point, every household will have some response for them, at least a population count. So as far as our operational part, that part is done. It, it is crunching the numbers from that point forward and creating that redistricting file that will not be delivered until April the 1st of 2021, but those apportionment counts will be delivered the end of this year, as we said before. Minimal data, but it is the apportionment counts that are delivered. Very good. So going back to that point, if the census drives how we determine representation in Congress, what does that then mean for our community? So for Christine, you know, how, what, would, what would you say to community advocates like members of OCA about what they can do to Greg, I think we lost you a little bit. I think we lost Greg a little bit there. If you can repeat your question to Christine. Involved in the redistricting process. Is there, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay, sorry, I'll make it quick. Christine, how can the community get involved in the redistricting process? Well, I, actually, uh, I know Jerry uh, had some slides that he wanted to show in regards to the redistricting process. So I'm actually going to pivot to him and then I'll come back and actually I have some other closing remarks about what chapters can do. Okay, very good, Jerry. Yeah, so I think um, one thing, you, I mean, it, it shouldn't be a question, hopefully, um, to any of the chapters, whether they should get involved in redistricting. I hope that's not a, we're, I'm gonna try and make the case for you here that that shouldn't be a question. You, you must be involved and have as many community members involved in the redistricting process as possible. Uh, I'm gonna show you just briefly uh, some slides of what we did in New York in the last round. Um, as you see the date here, September 7th, uh, 2011. So we started about April, the end or mid, of, mid to end of April, and we were able to submit these maps in September. And what we did, this first one I'm showing you is a neighborhood in Queens in New York City. That's Flushing, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, we, we sat down with community members. So for example, it could be an OCA chapter. Uh, in this case, it was a Ming Kwan organization, a based organization in Flushing. And uh, we actually had several organizations there. We asked them to outline, tell us the boundaries of your neighborhood, north, south, east, west. And we had a street map on, uh, on the wall. And uh, there was obviously some difference of opinion on, <laughs> excuse me, my three-year-old is uh, crashing in here. Um, there, there was some difference of opinion, obviously. Some people said it was, you know, flushing ended at the railroad tracks or at the school or at this subway stop or, you know, whatever it was. And then uh, we sort of had this iterative process 
process where we uh, came to a consensus. This is what we ended up with. And uh, we, we ran the census data um, to get the demographic information there. And uh, we also asked them to describe the neighborhood to us, common characteristics. And this accompanies the maps, right? So um, housing stock, uh, common transportation lines, uh, religious uh, institutions that were in the neighborhood, if there was a common school district, common employers, uh, what kind of housing stock is it? Is it single family, multifamily apartments, all these things. Um, and we put that together into a narrative. And this was what we call a community of interest. And this was one of the building blocks that we used in the redistricting process, because we're gonna take the census data and redraw all new legislative districts for census, for state assemblies, state senate, city council, school board, you name it, we're gonna be redrawing it uh, in redistricting. And the question is, how are these new districts gonna be put together? Um, the first step you need to do is identify your neighborhood. And we did this for 15 different Asian American neighborhoods. And you'll see the population sizes are all different. Um, and you know, for example, right here, I have Elmhurst up here, also in Queens, 89,000. That by itself is not gonna be enough for most legislative districts. Right, they're all different sizes, and uh, one of the smaller ones, let's say State Assembly in New York, is about 130,000. So they would need to be surrounding population to be included uh, to form a district. So that's the next question: What are the surrounding neighborhoods that should be grouped with your neighborhood to make a new district? Right, uh, and the last question is: What are the surrounding neighborhoods that should not be grouped with your community because you have different interests and it wouldn't be a good fit? Right, uh, so we take that information to come up with our own uh, uh, proposals. And uh, as I mentioned, we had 15 different ones. We're gonna go through here. Uh, we did this for Queens, Brooklyn, uh, and Manhattan. And these were the building blocks that we used to construct new districts. Let me quickly go down, if I could. Nope, not letting me. And on the last, what well, the last few slides that we have here uh, is arguably the most important part. Uh, and this is, I hope we'll, we'll drive the point home to you why redistricting is so important. Um, what we did is we took these 15 different Asian American neighborhoods. This is the last neighborhood slide, Chinatown, the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And this is the slide, the blue lines that you see here these are the 15 different neighborhoods uh, that I just scrolled through. That's the blue lines. The red dotted lines, those are, or the, those were the then existing state assembly lines. And if you look closely, look at, at all these blue lines. They're all dissected into numerous different districts by the assembly lines. Okay, this is vote dilution. Uh, this is why so many times our community despite all of our efforts in naturalization, voter registration, get out the vote and voter protection, despite all those things, we're still unable to elect candidates of our choice from our community. This is why, and this is not a coincidence. Uh, this happens in many places around the country. Uh, this one district right here, South Ozone Park, Richmond Hill, this one Asian American community of interest was divided into six different assembly districts. That community never had a chance, okay? If everyone comes out and votes, they cannot affect the outcome in any of those six different assembly districts. And what does that mean? That means the six different assembly members that represent that community do not have to pay any attention to that community because they, they don't have to be accountable to them because that community cannot affect the outcome of the election, all right? Um, and I, I know I've taken some time. I'm going to just conclude with this. Uh, in New York City, and I think like a lot of other places, the only way, the only way we were ever able to elect an Asian American to office is when we had fair redistricting. When a new district was centered and whole within an Asian American community of interest. It happened at city council, John Liu. 
where Flushing was the center. Uh, it happened at the state assembly level where Jimmy Meng was first elected. Um, and for Congress, one, two, three, four, five Asian American communities of interest were drawn together uh, by a special master. We litigated a case in New York and uh, they adopted our proposed district that kept these Asian American communities of interest together, centered in Flushing. And six months later, the first ever Asian American was elected to Congress from New York State, Grace Meng. Right. This is power. Um, and it is the most effective voter suppression tactic out there, in my opinion, because okay. this lasts for 10 years. And uh, this map can give you some, some, uh, some indication of how bad it is. Every single Asian American community of interest, some of them are in six different districts, some are in five, some are in three, some are right down the middle. Um, this is what's being done to our community. This is how, how can we have to fight back? Um, if we have it this bad, it's gonna be this bad for 10 years. If we get it right, it can be good and it will be right for 10 years. So uh, I'll just, I'll leave it there. Um, but uh, hopefully that drove home a little bit. And this is just the state assembly. If you see in state Senate, it's the same thing. Um, it's divided to multiple different districts, almost all of them. Um, so this happens all across the country and this is why we need to be involved. All the work we did with census and all the other great work that you're all doing, it's gonna be really out the window if we don't get redistricting right. So let me just leave it there. Thanks so much, Jerry, for really getting into that. Um, so where we're at with time is we actually do have some a decent amount of time for questions. And I know a number of you have posed them in the Drift app, so we can just jump straight into those. Um, so I'll, I'll send it back to Christine, one, to see if you have anything else you wanna add on redistricting, but more specifically to API votes work um, from a voting perspective, what advice would you give to young people who, who are looking to get involved? Right, so like I said, we're, we think we're on the right track, we're on the right trend. Um, the younger demographic is actually a large portion of our population. Um, and there seems to be a lot more activism, all the polling and surveys that do include API young people. It is showing that, um, that they are actually being more active in all the different campaigns. Um, so the thing is, the reality is that many of them are online, are connected with their peers through all the different apps. Um, so we are um, making sure that all of our different partners are using a Rock the Vote uh, voter registration tool. So for instance, um, OCA should have placed in the chat, um, it says text AAPI to 788 683. If you do that, you could go ahead and start the process for registering to vote for yourself or even re-registering. Now, at the same time, I would love for you during this week is to go ahead and take that and send it out to 10 of your friends today. Um, and then what we could do is track how many registrations come through. So it's not just enough, it's not enough to just post, but we need to go ahead and make sure that we go ahead and track and, and actually deliver some, on some voter registrations. Um, at the same time, since you many of you are at home or also connecting up with your um, extended families, what, however way you may define that, um, we are looking at intergenerational uh, voter registration efforts and education. We're relying on the younger generation to go ahead and also talk to your family members and your friends about registering to vote, right? Um, and then later on, once we have individuals registered, we need to focus on um, educating them about what's on the ballot. It's not just about the presidential elections, it's also about voting down the ticket. And many times people don't even know who their congressional members are or if there is even a local race. Um, so we need to make sure that um, we provide that as well. So APIVO is going to have a lot of these resources on our website. Uh, follow us on Twitter. On um, We actually do have a TikTok and an Instagram. We're in collaboration with uh, Snapchat. So I'm like trying to like gain back my credibility by using you know, the Rolodex. Uh, uh, also at the same time, APIVO is going to be translating a lot of um, graphics and 
videos about early voting and the whole process of that for um, each state. So you're going to have content that you could use as well as for on WeChat and Kakao and especially for those who are trying to reach limited English proficient communities. And then for those of you who want to volunteer, we're going to have texting parties and phone banking parties. So we need as many volunteers. Um, so please, you know, go ahead and note in the chat room that you're, if you're interested, then that way I'll follow up with OCA in terms of um, reconnecting with you on that as well. But I also just want to flag like for some of our ambassador programs that API Vote hosts, They've done also ballot parties. And I think online ballot parties are gonna be a huge thing this year um, because it's, it's an opportunity to get everyone together in a room, quote unquote room, and to actually go through the ballot and really talk about some of the issues that you care about and to, to provide that safe space and reconnection and connecting it back to the elections. Thanks, Christine. Uh, so I see one question here, and it's one that we really have to address. Um, recently, the president tweeted and floated the idea of pushing back the date of the election. And so obviously, I'm sure all of you have opinions on that. So John, I know you've been uh, talking about this quite a bit. So give us your thoughts on that. Uh, the simple answer is there's nothing in the Constitution and nothing in federal law that would give him the power to change election day, period, full stop. If you go further into it, uh, staff, federal statutes provide that, uh, the, if everyone remembers back to Schoolhouse Rock, this works on an electoral college system, right? And so the elect electors of the electoral college have to deliver their votes to Congress by the middle of December. Uh, so that is a date fixed in Congress and by statute in, in congressional law. And then if you will go backwards from there, Congress did set a general election day. That's the date that we all know, November 3rd. I think it's the third, whatever that Tuesday is. Uh, but then it's up to the states. Each individual state could, under certain, some of their state's legislation for emergency powers, uh, dictate that that election can be moved backwards. But then as long as they don't run up against that December 14th deadline, because if they run up against the December 14th deadline, in theory, that state loses out on participating in the electoral college system. There's been congressional studies done about this, as you might imagine, after Bush v. Gore. And so all of this, and after 9-11, I might add, people started thinking about, oh, do we need contingency plans? And the conclusion they all came up with is, at most, maybe Congress can delegate some additional authority to president, but the president does not have that authority now. Very good. Um, Kathy, there's been a couple of questions that have been posed. Actually, before we get that, for everyone who's watching, there's still... Uh, a chance to get your questions submitted to us through Drifta, so feel free uh, to send them our way. But uh, I guess a few of the questions that have come through are going back to moving again uh, this collection date from the 31st to the end of September. Um, and I guess the, the question is, what is the Census Bureau doing to make sure um, you can all meet your, your statutory deadlines and also your statutory responsibilities of ensuring a, a complete count if we're moving that date? Well, I think the one positive thing about COVID-19 is we kind of have a captive audience. A lot of people are working from home and I think that's going to really help our efforts uh, when we go back to those homes who have not responded to the census. Uh, one of the things when we go to a household, we'll leave a notice of visit and that's gonna encourage them to go online or pick up that paper questionnaire they previously had and complete it right then. Uh, then we don't have to go back. We have a new thing, avoid the knock uh, for the 2020 census just for non-response follow-up. Uh, that's one good way to avoid one of our enumerators. Uh, so we're encouraging people to do that. But the main thing is every single home that has not responded, we will be sending someone to that home. So if we are after visits, repeated visits, we're not able to get someone, we'll go to their neighbor to at least get a population count for every one of them. And we'll go through this process until we actually finish the census. And I can't say we're finished until I have something for every single household on our master address list. Actually, I also wanna jump in. Um, I know at the end of August, there is discussion and planning for an API week of action. So already like in California, a number of the nonprofit organizations and coalitions are planning a API census caravan 
up and down, starting in San Francisco to Santa Clara to LA, Orange County, and then San Diego. And we're also looking to, uh, for other cities that if you're interested in creating a caravan, we would love to actually have a national caravan on August 29th. Um, but there's also going to be a lot of other activities that are being planned for that week. I think it's really important for us to do whatever we can to um, get out the count really earlier on, um, just because this, there's going to be a lot more noise as the elections gets closer. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, if there's a lot more um, noise in regards to like the dates shifting, it's just better to get it done and over with early on. Yeah, and let me just add quickly, I agree with Christina, let's get it done now. Let's not get distracted by the presidential memo. Let's not get distracted by the changing dates. Frankly, something that I tell people from my perspective is leave it to organizations like mine, organizations like Jerry. We'll fight the legal battles. We'll fight the policy battles. Your job is to respond to the census. Your job is to get your friends and family to respond to the census. Very good. Uh, not sure if I'm having internet problems again. Uh, while you're doing that, I do want to go ahead and share one thing um, because, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about early voting. Um, and so I just want to make sure that people realize what you can do. Um, this is actually some some of the dates and, you know, just to realize that the laws really are, differ from state to state. So, you know, actually a number of states, you could go ahead and apply for your absentee or mail-in ballot right now. And so we encourage you uh, to really get out the word to your constituents um, that, you know, when in doubt, go ahead and apply for your ballot and go ahead and start that process now. Um, and many of those states, um, you also have the ability that if you have your ballot and you forgot to turn it in, that you could still go ahead and on election day, turn it in. Um, all this type of data is also going to be um, on API Votes website. We have um, a map of the US. You just click on your particular state and all that data will be made available for you. So uh, there's one question I saw that I want to give kudos to whoever asked it because it's, it's, it's a very thoughtful question. I'm going to pose it to the group for anyone who wants to jump in. Um, but the question was, and I think it really speaks to some of the structural challenges of the census happening every 10 years. Um, but what if someone is living in an area uh, in which there are low-income families that are being displaced? What impact would that have? What, what impact would the census have on that? Because would that then mean that vulnerable population dollars um, that are a function of the census would go to neighborhoods that they would not live in? I don't know if Kathy wants to address that or oh. if you want me. Sorry, uh, <laughs> trying to unmute. Way. Okay, well, it, as far as, as the census itself, we're asking people to respond as of April 1st. So it's where you were as of April 1st. Um, and that's really where the money ends up going. So if they've been displaced, where were you on April 1st? Right. It is a challenge because there are going to be people that are displaced during this period between April 1st and whenever. The other mm -hmm. amendment I might offer, a point of clarity is uh, it is a place for college students. It is where you typically would have been on April 1st. So in, in that case, many of them ended up coming home because of COVID-19. But if they would have been at their university during that normal time, that would be still where they would be counted in that instance. So Kathy, a question for you came in. Uh, you know, you pointed out that enumerators were going to be begin circulating sometime in mid-August. Um, but uh, one of one of our participants have noted that in Northern Virginia. So whether or not that is something that, is something that can be accounted for by the bureau. I'm sorry, you're breaking up, so I didn't hear the question. Um, Enumerators have been spotted in Northern Virginia uh, already. Is that something that lines up with the Bureau's plans given that um, there was some indication that it could start in mid-August as opposed to now? We actually started in several areas. We had uh, three phases of what we call an early launch, um, basically to test out our systems in areas that were safe. So we have actually started in several areas of the country 
even in my region, most of the 12 states, uh, people are going to hit the field starting next week uh, before that April, sorry, before that August 11th date. And one thing I do want people to know is when we show up at your door, we're going to have a mask on, we're going to have sanitizer, we're going to have a little handheld device, it's going to be really easy to spot us, and then we're going to be backing up after we knock on that door to keep that six foot distancing. So it'll look a little different than in the past. A question then uh, for Jerry and John again, uh, going back to you know, this election that has been, uh, that we have significant challenges heading into it. Um, what happens if there are challenges with mail-in voting or absentee ballots? Um, what happens if the results of the election are questioned? Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna be uh, monitoring the situation and take it as it comes. Uh, I know there's we're, we're part of several um, collaboratives, litigation collaboratives. Um, John's organization is as well, um, where we're closely monitoring any type of uh, voter suppression maneuvers leading up to election day. We're going to be doing our Asian American exit poll and poll monitoring program with many of, uh, of the OCA chapters on election day, because there still is gonna be some degree of in-person voting um, in a lot of places around the country. And we'll handle that the way, the way that we usually do. What's gonna be different this time around definitely is the large amount of absentee ballots, uh, mail-in ballots. Um, and uh, that's gonna take some time to count. So, unless there's a really, you know, uh, substantial victory in a, in a certain state, uh, we may not know who won that state for some time. Um, so I think as long as we know what to expect, um, you know, uh, we can be prepared. But, you know, I think even with Trump making, you know, his suggestion uh, this, this past week, it didn't really surprise anyone. <laughs> a lot of people were saying he was going to say something along these lines. Um, so I th we're, we're poised to litigate. We're poised to defend voters. Um, and, you know, if he doesn't accept the, the results of the election, I mean, uh, he, he can say what he wants. He's going to have to leave January 20th, um, whether it's, you know, escorted by, you know, uh, federal authorities out of the White House. Uh, that's going to be a question. Um, one thing I did see in, in uh, Newsweek, which really kind of concerned me, was uh, this scenario they, they had mentioned of um, Trump calling into question the results and initiating an investigation and, and certain states um, not sending any delegates uh, for the electoral count um, because uh, they say there's this ongoing investigation. And in that scenario, it goes to the House and uh, each state, uh, their congressional contingent uh, will submit a single vote. And in that scenario, there's actually right now, there's 26 uh, congressional delegations that are um, controlled by Republicans. Uh, so there is some concerning um, uh, possibilities. But the good thing is we're getting out in front of it now when we're, storing, we're, we're trying to strategize how to uh, how to uh, beat back against that. Uh, I don't want to leave on a negative note like that, but I do want to say I was somewhat pleased to see the pushback for the first time from a lot of really staunch uh, supporters of the president to say, no, 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 there's going to be an election on November 3rd, at least on, on this front. Great. So, you know, one thing that I realized, and this is going back to you, Jerry, so sorry to keep you on the mic, but your presentation, I really appreciated on the importance of redistricting. And, you know, you throw a lot in from really go back to this point about how communities are diluted in terms of their voting power if we are not engaged in the redistricting process. Uh, Greg, unfortunately, we've lost you for a little bit, so you're going to have to repeat the question or maybe just put it in the chat box so we can have Jerry respond to it. Oh, sorry, everybody. Um, 
We can okay, hear you I'll, now. I'll try it again. We finished our Zoom bingo with someone having a bad connection. Unfortunately, it was me. Um, I know we had a child crasher, which fills another box. But Jerry, just real quick, again, go back to that point about the importance of redistricting and how a community's vote can be diluted if we are not engaged in that process. Yeah, so, you know, we, we have some protections under the Voting Rights Act, and they become stronger if we're able to draw uh, a district that is majority Asian American. Now, at some of the larger levels, like congressional and state Senate, um, that is challenging. And a lot of times we can't get there. And all we really have to rely on is communities of interest. And it is very powerful to have community members submit even their community map, just the ones I showed you, uh, without even having a district or an entire district configuration set up, which is, is complicated. Um, community members can just come with that community boundary and say, these are our boundaries. Uh, this is what makes us unique. This is why we are a community of interest. And we should not be divided at any legislative level. And there are there are definitely bigger possibilities at the smaller levels for school board, town council, city council, uh, because those are smaller districts. There are usually uh, opportunities to have a majority district. And, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, how you look at it, there is racially polarized voting in a lot of places, especially in local races. Um, so, this is not a political issue. This is really a human rights, a voting rights issue. And for some of you that may think that redistricting is very political, it definitely can be, and a lot of times it is. But from the angle that we're coming at it from and a lot of the groups that we work with, this is, this is not Republican or Democrat. You notice I didn't say that once when I was talking about redistricting. We're talking about empowering the community to put them on equal footing as other communities, right? Um, and I think when you put it that way, it's hard to, you know, dispute when we, I show you these maps and you see that our communities are divided into numerous different districts. I mean, no one can say that's fair, right? But we need to be at the table to show, hey, look what's happening to us. Uh, and if anyone has ever testified at one of these hearings, you'll see that every single person that testifies says the same thing this is my community, it should not be divided. But if we're not there, well, guess who's gonna get divided, <laughs> right? Um, so it really is important. It's gonna, like I said, it's gonna last for 10 years. And when we have gotten it right, because we were at the table, we were aggressive, we were you know, fighting for our voting rights in a nonpartisan way, which is the way that we do it. Um, we, when we were successful, we had results. The community then was able to elect a candidate of its choice. Then we have somebody fighting for us in the legislature. Thanks so much. So, you know, and, and John, I'm sorry, should, and they can address a lot of the issues that we talked about, you know, or, or a lot of issues that all of our groups work on. They can be, you know, then we can, it really solves itself. So it's the gift that keeps on giving for 10 years. That's right. All right, we have a few minutes left. We're gonna do a lightning round. You have 30 seconds each to make one final plug for census voting and or redistricting, whatever you prefer. We'll start with you, Christine, ready to go. You're on mute, but we're gonna count that against your time. I'm all about action. So I am asking you use those links and those resources I dropped in the chat. Um, be a partner for National Voter Registration Day and early vote so that way we could get you all the information and provide you with the tools and work with your chapters to mobilize your local communities. All right, next we'll go to John. Uh, I agree with Christine, it's not rocket science. There are people that are trying to scare us away from voting. There's people that are trying to scare us away, uh, discourage us from being counted in the census. Best way to respond, especially for a group like this, is to just stand up, be counted, stand up, vote, and then get your friends, get your family to do the same. And I agree with Jerry, it's not, part, uh, it's not partisan in this way. It's just making sure that democracy gets exercised. Great, Kathy? It's not too late to be counted. Make sure you go online, complete your census form and ask your neighbor, ask your friend, 
call your entire family and make sure they got counted too. And last but certainly not least, Jerry. Okay. Uh, if you're at home, please raise your hand if you don't like being counted. Okay. Hopefully nobody raised their hand. Um, you know, this is our community. We're all, you know, everybody's, you know, uh, involved. A lot of people, taxpayers, families, raising kids. Um, if you care about your community, if you care about us, uh, you care about yourself, um, fill out the census, do something on election day. I've been saying, I think for the last few elections, this is the most election, most important election of our lifetime. This really is. Um, we need you. Um, if you're, you know, you can volunteer with ALDEF. We ask for three hours on election day. If not, you know, uh, you have to do something with, with advancing justice or API vote. You have to do commit, take the day off. This is really something that requires it. So uh, we'll see you uh, involved in census. Hope to see you on election day and afterwards on redistricting. Your community needs you. Thank you all very much. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We are right at time. It's been my pleasure again, Greg Gordon with NCAPA. I wish you all the best. Remember that on your Drifta app, there are a number of events for tomorrow that you can keep an eye on. OCA is encouraging you to attend their plenary tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time and then the closing ceremony at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Everybody have a good night and thank you again.